I have to apologize for my voice. It's, um, it's gone a bit. Um, I'm bitterly disappointed because um, I was hoping this year to be the lead in the snowman at Litchfield Cathedral. <laughs> I've been practicing, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think my voice is broken. <laughs> so today, um, we're not preaching today as such. Jacqueline and I are sharing today. And um, uh, I want to welcome you all, particularly if you're visiting. Um, but it is a bit different today. It's about family today, church family today. And, um, you know, every, every church has its unique road to walk that God has given it. And uh, as we walk that road, there are pivotal moments in the church life that almost, um, I'm very pictorial, so they almost come like gates across the road that God has given us to walk. And when a church comes up to that pivotal moment, it has a choice. It can choose to settle where it is, or in faith it can open that door and step in to what God has further along that road for the future. And so what we're sharing today is what God has been speaking to us as a couple, as a leadership team over these last months of the future of Ruji Community Church. And so this is about us all today because it's all about us stepping through that gate into the new season that God has for us. But sometimes when, when you reach a pivotal moment, you have to look back to understand why you're stepping forward into a different season. And so I'm going to start by stepping back. And um, I'm going to turn, and I'm going to go to November 2008. Who remembers what they were doing in November 2008? No, I don't know what I was doing last Sunday, let alone this. But anyway. As a couple, we believed that um, in November 2008 that uh, God wanted us to go to a church called IHOP Church in Kansas, USA. It's called IOP. It's the International House of Prayer. And uh, so we went for a long weekend to Kansas. Yes, you heard that right. We went for a long weekend to Kansas. That's crazy, isn't it? But you know, God will ask us at times to do things that are crazy, that seem humanly not to make any sense. He will ask us to do things that cost us financially, that cost us in time. And God did all of that by asking us to go to Kansas. I was in secular work at the time, and um, <laughs> when I told my work colleagues, they said, oh, what are you doing this weekend? I said, oh, I'm popping over to a church in Kansas. And they all look at me and said, uh, are you out of your mind, Richard? Going to a church in Kansas for a long weekend? Well, it made me smile because what does Paul say about that in 2 Corinthians 5, 13? He says, if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. What Paul is saying is that our lives should honor God in everything that we do. Like Paul, we no longer live our own life. We live for Jesus Christ who died and rose for us on the cross. We should be passionate in putting him first in our lives for what he has done for us. And you know, when we are obedient to God, he does things with us and through us that he chooses not to do when we expect him to turn up on our terms. Now, that weekend has changed and shaped Jacqueline and my lives for the last 15 years. Why did we go? Well, besides God telling us to go, there were two other reasons. The first is, since the 19th of September 1999, IHOP have had a prayer and worship uh, room that you can see there that worships and praises God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You'd, be, you'd, you'd love their worship rotor. On the wall, it went from that corner 
to about where the uh, curtains are because every two hours the worship teams changed and they changed in a way that the, the previous worship team would still worship and the guys coming up for the next two hours would start to worship so there was no break in worship there was no break in prayer and that is still going on to this day and I say this picture doesn't do it justice, but when you go in that room, when you go in, you feel the presence of God in there. Because you're realizing you're in a place where this prayer and worship didn't just start five, ten minutes ago. When we went in that room, it had been going for nine years. And there's a depth, a depth through the longevity of worship and prayer that we had never experienced before. The second reason we wanted to go was because IHOP Church has a very strong gifting in the prophetic, and we wanted to attend one of their prophetic training courses over the weekend. Part of that training is that you get an opportunity to be prayed for in that prayer room. They have these little booths, and um, they give you words of encouragement, but they gave us more than that. They talked about our future, and you think, well, what is prophecy? I'm a simple guy. If I take prophecy, it is God communicating with man. It is what the New Testament talks about and is what we should be doing in this day, today. So they, they prophesied over us. And then they gave us a little thing, and some of you are going to look at me blankly, called a cassette tape with all that they prophesied. They prophesied for at least an hour, I think it was, wasn't it? And um, they made, well, I don't know if they saw our shoulders going up a bit, because they said, your city, you're going to do this in your city. God wants to do this over your city. And we thought, Rimpy's not really a city, is it? It's, just, it's a bit of a town. But you know, God has since corrected me on that, because this is his city. Wherever you live is a city. Because does, doesn't God say that where his people are, we are to be a city on a hill? And so this is his city. And they prophesied. And we came back with this cassette tape, and bless her, Wendy, Wendy typed up all that was on that cassette tape. Eight pages. Eight pages of encouragement of what God was saying to us. But God, through that prayer room, through what he was saying to us, he did something in our hearts. We came away with a vision and a passion and a mandate to see a church that would be in a facility that brought the love of Jesus to our community. Now, moving on a year, mid-2009, God clearly called me to lead Rugeley Community Church. And I accepted his call. But you know, when God calls you to something, it is no light-hearted matter. The faithfulness of a call requires faithfulness and obedience to the one who has called you and an unswerving commitment to his call. No church leader should lead out of duty. It should be that they have been called to lead his church because that consists of heart, vision, passion, anointing and grace to fulfill that role. When we look when Jack and I look at where Rugeley Community Church is today, we believe that we have fulfilled the vision and the mandate that God called us to in November 2008. Prophetically, everything on those eight pages has been fulfilled. I just marvel at God because I'll be honest, when they were giving us some of the words of encouragement, I was thinking, how is that ever going to be, God? And Have you ever been to Rugeley? You know, it made us think, oh, but isn't that vision? It's what we can't see now, but God is going to do in the future. I want to say that as a couple, as a church, we firmly believe in the prophetic for today as what is said in the New Testament and to be outworked, as it says in the New Testament. We have led our lives by that. We moved from London to East Sussex. We moved from East Sussex to Rugeley. 
We wouldn't be standing here. I wouldn't be standing here if God hadn't have told us that to do. We are in a facility that God told us about 7,000 miles away in November of 2008. We didn't know what this actual building was going to be then, but we're in it. We're in it. We've moved from a small corner in Fernwood Drive to a facility that is at the heart of the community. And you know, it's been a journey that's involved faith and unswerving commitment to the vision that God gives us, had given us. And I'm thankful for the people who have helped do that along the way. For Eric and Philippa, for directors like Dave and Wendy, Andy, Bill and Sheila, Alan Ball. They've all played their part along. Dave, when we moved into the center, Dave Webb, all that we had to do in setting that up. When we moved into this center in 2015, it took us just over three years to get it established. But church, don't ever forget the miracle that God did in moving us in. We're in a building four times the size of the old building. When we moved in here, I go straight to 2 Kings 7, the siege of Samaria. You know the four men who had leprosy? They went to surrender to the Armenian army. And when they got there, God had confused them and the army had scattered and they were left with all the riches and the plunder. Now, I want to reassure you, we didn't have leprosy when we came in. But the plunder that we were left, stationery, tables, chairs, projectors, we're still using stationery from 2015 to this day. They left everything, everything, including a box of keys that deep that we had to work through to find out which door opened which. But church, don't ever forget the miracle that God did in providing this facility. And then from 2019, Chris, when he came in as centre manager, has just taken the centre to another level. And we honour and thank you for that. He has grown what was laid as a foundation. And yet in these last couple of years as senior leaders, God has shown us that we as a church are moving into a new season. We are at that pivotal moment on that road. In that his church, not just his love, is to be established in this community. You know, in fulfilling everything that we felt God has laid on our heart back in 2008 in vision and mandate, Jacqueline and I have come to a point where we realize that it needs a different skill set and a different vision to take the church on to what it did, what we were given back in 2008. And listen, church, that's not negative. A healthy church is an evolving church. Because God is the great creator who is continuously moving out and working out his purposes. As many of you know, I was given some time last year as a sabbatical. And in that time and space, I think just confirmation came that as a couple, we were entering a time, a transitioning out of leading Rugeley Community Church. That it was time to hand the baton over so that the church could be taken on. Before my sabbatical, a couple of people gave us prophetic words, and you were part of this, Lisa. Yeah, I know. <laughs> where it was that sense of we were coming into a season where everything would look the same, but everything would seem different. I could stay leading Ruji Community Church until I'm 66, retirement age, another 30 years. <laughs> Well, not quite. <laughs> and you know, to some, the leading would still look the same. But God has done something in our hearts to begin to release us from that. That's the different bit. I read a book while I was on sabbatical by a guy called David Runcorn. It's Fear and Trust, God-Centered Leadership. And he says this. He says that when God looks at the leader of the church, he doesn't look at the size of the congregation he looks at the heart of the leader that's leading it. 
our heart is telling us it wouldn't be right to continue leading until my retirement age. We have always put God first. And we will continue to put God first. And we will hopefully continue to act in faith, not duty. And we see ret- as uh, handing the baton over on, not as, re- as um, retirement, we see it as redeployment. None of us ever finish in the kingdom. So we're excited about what God is going to use us and do with us in new challenges. But we recognize that for a healthy transition, there needs to be key elements put in place. And so to this end, I'm going to step aside from leading Ruji Community Church and being a director in March 2024. That needs to be a clean break from both so that there's no gray areas. By that time, I would have been in some form of eldership and leadership nearly 25 years. I would have been a trustee, stroke director for nearly 22 years. And we just feel it's time to hand that baton over. We're excited about what God has for us. But in stepping aside, it will also free up my wages to help restructure the center. And I'll explain why that's important in a second. Currently, our heart's desire is that we stay part of this family beyond 2024. We want to support, not be a hindrance or interference, we want to support. You don't see that, if I'm truthful, happening much in church. The leader steps aside and suddenly they've been evaporated, they've gone somewhere. I don't see how that is a, as a reflection of church family. Now, I know this, it's not easy always, but I hope we have the temperament and heart where we can be a support and not an interference in that. So what about the leadership of Ruji Community Church? Well, I hope and pray that what I'm about to share isn't a surprise to you. Because God is always working and preparing beyond our mindset and where we are. And to some ends, what happens when that is happening is that when somebody says something, people think, well, isn't that already happening? Because God is already at work. Over these last two years, Jacqueline, Chris, Liz and myself have led and been meeting as senior leaders of this church. Unknowingly or knowingly, God has been preparing us for this pivotal moment. In these last two years, I think we could all agree that we've seen Chris grow in leadership. There's lots of nodding heads, that's good. Yeah. No, I think we can, seriously. Family members have noticed that and shared that with me. And Jacqueline and myself fully believe that Chris has the skill set, the vision, and the mandate to take this church forward. To build upon what we have laid to establish the church at the center and heart of the community and this center. Now, as you may have noticed at the beginning, this is a two-parter. So on the 29th of January, Chris is going to come and share his journey. But I just want to briefly make two things clear. When we shared our heart to Chris and Liz, there was no pressure put on Chris that automatically, now you'll have to take this on. That, that's not what it's about. We were clear what we were to do, and that gave us two paths. Hopefully and prayerfully, yes, it would be Chris, but if that wasn't to be then we would look to bring someone else in. There was no pressure because Chris, just like I had to do, had to know that he was called to lead Rugely Community Church. What do I mean by called? Well, maybe you'll find this helpful. Calling in the context of leadership selection and appointment has to do with the leader's sense of call of God, not just on their life as a minister, but to a particular church. This sense of being called is vital to the leader's confidence, courage, and strength in the face of the inevitable challenges that they will encounter in fulfilling their God-given assignment. Calling on a leader is key. 
Now, you might find this surprising, or perhaps hard to believe, but pastoring a church can have its frustrations. <laughs> it can have its disappointments, hurts, and its challenges. In my 25 years of being an elder, I, I am never failed to be amazed by some Christians, and none are in this room, who seem to think that leaders are... are um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, immune to frustration, to challenges, to life. And that's not true. That's not true. Sometimes people will say to you, well, it's all right for you. No, actually, for leaders, sometimes it's not all right for us. But what the call does is it enables us to stay focused on and on track in those times. It enables God to lead us through them with the support of the family. So to this end, the directors have been fully involved, so that's us as leaders and Andy and Matt. And we wanted to give time, uh, Chris some time and space to pray and seek God. You know, Chris taking on the baton of leading Rimuju Community is something that we've talked about as leaders in the leadership team on occasions through these last two years. But Chris needed to know that call for himself. That confirmation came in that time that he was off with a reassurance that God had called him to lead Rimuju Community Church into its new season. And that is a calling that both Jacqueline and myself and the directors fully endorse. My second point that I want to make clear is that we're talking about Chris leading the church and having his finger on the pulse of the center, not still managing it. It's not Chris being center manager and leading the church. He needs to lead this church. So that means that we need to put in a structure within the center to free up Chris to be able to do that. That's our priority for this coming year. That's what I'm praying and hope in releasing my wages will help do in restructuring that. Putting a structure in place for the centre that frees up Chris to begin focusing on the church is something that we would look to hope to have and be able to do by mid-year. Because there needs to come in that time between now and next March where... I'm not leading, but Chris is leading and I'm supporting him until such days that I'm no longer involved in that respect. Jacqueline is going to come and share in a moment. And I think I want you to hear what she's saying because it's ever so important. She's going to be talking about how in every area of change, we each have a responsibility you know, this pivotal moment, we are all going through that gate. This is not something just the leaders and the directors and, oh yeah, here comes the rest. No, we go as one. We're one family in Christ. Now, there will be times, as Jacqueline's going to say, where there will be shifting and shaking. Change involves shifting and shaking. And that, to be honest, can make us feel unsettled in time. So we've got to be aware, Church family, that we might be unsettled at times. But that doesn't mean it's a negative. It just means God's at work. It's how we read the times that's important. See, well. <laughs> so I hope you've been encouraged. I'm always encouraged when I hear the stories of what God's been doing. And uh, it gives you impetus to know that you have a hope and a God that is faithful for what's ahead. Um, you're going to have to bear with me because this isn't really my thing. So, you know, I'm not really good at it. So um, uh, just bear with me. But I want to share my heart as to what God's been saying to me. And sometimes what he's saying to one individual, you just sense is, is for a corporate, is, is for more. So this is what I, I sense God's been, been saying. And as Richard has said, you know, um, in every, er, every area of change, there is a responsibility that each one of us has. 
the changes, the transition, the shifting, the stretching that's happening in our lives demands a response. And we each have a responsibility to hear from God for ourselves. So it's not just me and Richard and the leadership team, it's, it's for each one of us. You know, because at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. It always has been about Jesus, it always will be about Jesus. And we want to focus our lives, our thoughts, our ministries, our evangelism, the church, we, everything is about Jesus. And to that end, we actually spent quite a lot of time this last year looking at that, looking at what it is to be rooted in Jesus, to be empowered, what that looks like, what it means to us. And I think we've seen that through, through all of this, Jesus has done, everything that Jesus has done has been motivated by love. And it's his love for us that gives us our identity. It's not who we are of ourselves, it's who we are through him. It's his love that gives us the ability to trust him. It's his love that makes him faithful, and our aim is to love like Jesus. This Jesus is calling us to be co-heirs with him. The all-loving, all-faithful, all-powerful God is calling us to partner with him. You know, we can learn to access the privileges of our relationship with God. Our calling is an overflow of who we are, and we have access to the resources of who he is. And who doesn't want a deeper relationship and a revelation of Jesus and want to experience this in this coming year? I do. You know, recently I've been impressed with the story of Esther. She came a woman who came from obscurity, she found favor with the king, she became queen, she risks her life to save the Jewish people from destruction. And Mordecai, her uncle, said to her that she was born for such a time as this. And I feel God is saying to us, you know, we are born for such a time as this. It can be easy to wish we were back in the good old days. It can be easy to want to fast forward all the difficulties and sort of skip the difficult bits. But God is drawing himself, us to himself. And he is a God of love. And we have an opportunity in a new year to pursue that love. The more we yield to him, and to his sovereign supremacy, the more our hearts can trust him and rest on who he is and the strength of who he is. He is ever present because of his beautiful Holy Spirit that is residing in us. You know, our strength and oneness is in him and he isn't asking us to do anything on our own. That's the good thing. That is the good thing. So let's, I want to encourage us as individuals and as a church to determine in this coming year to explore love, to explore who Jesus is, to be able to understand our identity and authority in him and to partner and co-reign with him. Because what would that actually look like? In our relationships, our health, our businesses, our workplaces, if we saw a breakthrough in this. So I just really feel that God is reiterating, we have been born for such a time as this. We, you, me, are the ones to express the love and authority of Christ in these times so that we can show up as the bride of Christ and reveal him and walk by faith and not by sight. That's what 2 Corinthians tells us. That was, that's what it actually means to, I don't know if you've got that slide, to, 
For we live by faith and not by sight. That's what it means when we have prophetic words over us. When we look at the promises of God in the Bible. We do our life. We do life. But then we have these prophetic words. And Richard often talks about them being like balloons. That you sort of, they're out here. And you're praying them in. You're praying them in as you do daily walk with God. As you see the promises of God in scripture. And you're praying them in, you're, you're calling them in as we do life. And then suddenly, a, a prayer is fulfilled. Suddenly, a situation opens up and you think, oh, that's what that word was. And that is what it means to co-reign, to partner, to walk with him. It means giving over to God our fears, our addictions, our mistakes, unworthiness, because God wants us to have a divine perspective of what he sees and what he wants to do with our situations. And he wants us to be in agreement with him. So when we're pulling those prophetic words down, when we're agreeing and speaking out scripture and the promises of God, we are in agreement with what he is saying over us and over our situations. And I just wanted to remind you of two kings where Elisha prayed for his servant. And he he prayed, he said... Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes to see the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around. Because until that point, the servant, all he could see was the enemy army in front of him. And he was afraid. But then God opened his eyes to see what he could see. And it was a different perspective. And it seems to me that some of us have been discouraged by situations in our lives that seem not to have changed very much, despite how much we pray, how much we fast. We seem to be overwhelmed, and there's a sense of weariness, and the burden of the task ahead can often seem too great. But just like Esther, although scared and unsure, she put on her royal clothes. And she presented herself to the king. She obeyed even though she feared for her life. And despite her emotions, she obeyed. What is God calling you to do this year? You've heard what he's calling us, me and Richard, us as a leadership team, us as a church. You are the church. We are the church. What is God calling you to do this year? And if we remember that we are coming to a God of love who wants the best for us, then he will gently show us what needs to change. And because of his unconditional love for us, then we can trust what he wants to show us and step out into everything he is calling us to do. I think sometimes we give the enemy too much importance. And we don't put in the work that it takes to see a situation shift. We don't want to feel uncomfortable. We complain, but we do nothing. We're too tired to fight because it's hard work. But when we remember that we are in Christ, when we remember and recognize that we are fighting from victory because Jesus has died on the cross, and he's conquered death, then like Elisha's servant, we get a different perspective of the situations that we're in. And it takes effort, it takes faith, it takes courage to worship when you feel like crying, when you feel weary, when you're worn out. And it takes faith to speak victory over things that have been the same year on, year on, year on over dead relationships, speaking victory over your body, over your finances, over business, over the church. It takes faith. We live by faith, not by sight. It takes guts to be a Queen Esther when you have been an orphan in your mindset, in your thinking, in your behavior, all your life. But to be royalty... To be a child of God is who we are in and through him. 
Amen? Yeah. Yeah. That is how we are to think and to act. It is who we are to become in order to fulfill our identity and what God has for us here in Rougely and our spheres of influence. So Richard and I are continuing on our journey. For us, we are preparing to be redeployed, whatever that looks like for us. And with that inevitably comes transition. Um, I felt God say to us as a church that you will notice the shifting and the shaking that comes with this change. And for those of you who do, it's a time to build, it's a time to grow in new ways and new places. It is now when a little faith moves whole mountains for the future. That's exciting. Yeah. And it's now a time to recognize that we were born for such a time as this. Amen. So uh, as a church, we're standing at that pivotal gate and we're saying, will you all step with us? Will you all come with us? A um, couple of weeks, no, was funny. This week I received from Freedom in Christ something about the new year, and I thought that really ties in with where we're at. And um, it said this, And I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, Give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, Go out into the darkness and put your hand in the hand of the Lord. That shall be better than light and safer than a known way. So I went forth and finding the hand of God, trod gladly into the night. So yeah, there are gonna be lots of unknowns in this coming year. So we all need to take hold of the hand of the Lord and each other and trust him as he leads us through purposes and plans that he has already put in place. <coughs> Excuse me. Change involves the church. As Jack has said, my voice is going. <coughs> but that's corporately as well as individually. It's not just the leadership team and the directors. It's all of us. So, as Jacqueline said, we all have a responsibility. But let us be encouraged, just like Queen Esther, that we were each born for such a time as this. Amen? Amen. Now, Chris, come and speak on the 29th, part two. If you want to ask anything or have any thoughts, please speak to leadership team, directors. If you want to know more from us, then please book a time for a coffee. You'll get us quicker if you involve cake, but there will be, uh, we'll make time for that. So we just want to say goodbye to those online. If you've got any further questions, then please uh, just contact us at hello at rougelycc.org.uk.